The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So where we're going to begin today is continuing with our discussions of the substrates for GROW-EL, GROW-ES, and analysis of the data. And after that, we'll talk about the DNA-K, DNA-J chaperone system here. Okay. So recall last time we left off with the question of the GROW-EL, GROW-ES substrate. So inside an E. coli cell, what are the polypeptides that are folded by this macromolecular machine? And so there was the pulse chase experiment. There was immunoprecipitation. Okay and then analysis. And so in this analysis, we talked about doing two-dimensional two gel electrophoresis, um, and then trypsin digest and mass spec of the various spots. OK, so where we left off were with these data here, and the question, how many polypeptide substrates interact with GROW-EL in vivo, so inside an E. coli cell? And what we're looking at are the various gels for either total soluble cytoplasmic proteins on top at either zero minutes, so at the start of the pulse, recall that these cells were treated with radio-labeled methionine, and then there was a chase for a period of time when excess unlabeled methionine was added. So here we're looking at total soluble cytoplasmic proteins 10 minutes into the chase. And then at the bottom, what we're looking at are the polypeptides that were immunoprecipitated by treatment of this cell lysate with the anti grow -EL antibody. So the idea is this antibody will bind to grow -EL, and if polypeptides are bound, those will be pulled down as well. Right, so it's kind of incredible this experiment worked. There was a bunch of questions after class in terms of the details of this immunoprecipitation. Right, just to think about, is it a GROW-EL monomer or is it the GROW-EL heptamer? How tightly are these polypeptides bound? How do they stay bound during the course of the workup? Um, where's GROW-ES? Right, these are a number of questions um, to think about and to look at the experimental to see <coughs> about answers. So where we're going to focus is right now looking at these gels. And so what we need to ask is, what do we learn just from qualitative inspection of these data, right? So on these, along the y-axis, we have molecular weight. And along the x-axis, the PI. So if we first take a look at the total soluble cytoplasmic proteins at 0 minutes and 10 minutes, what do we see? Do we see many spots or a few spots? Yeah, many spots, right? And we see many spots both at zero minutes and at 10 minutes. Okay, so the E. coli genome encodes over 4,000 proteins, roughly 4,300. And um, if one were to go and count all of these spots, how many do we see? It's on the order of 2,500. Okay, so they detect it on the order of 2,500 different cytoplasmic proteins um, on these gels. What do we see in terms of distribution by molecular weight? Is it a broad distribution or a you know, narrow distribution? Broad, right? We're seeing spots of all different molecular weights, so from low to high on this gel. What about PI? It's also broad. Yeah, we also have a broad distribution in these gels, right? So we see polypeptides of low, through high PI on this scale from um, 4 to 7. 
So now what we want to do is look at the gels obtained for the samples from the immunoprecipitation and ask what do we see? And is that the same or different from what we see for the total cytoplasmic proteins up here? Okay, so if we look at the data here, which are the polypeptides that were obtained from immunoprecipitation at zero minutes, what do we see? So we do, do we see a few spots, a lot of spots? Okay, so let's start with the first point Kenny made, which is that we have a lot of spots, right? And I'd argue that's true, right? In this gel, we see many spots where each spot indicates a distinct polypeptide. Do we see the same or less than here for the total cytoplasmic protein? Less. We see less, yeah, right? We'll see more concentrated. Yeah, just wait. That, that, <laughs> just wait a second, right? So we see less, and that's a good sign right, because an antibody was used to pull down some, some fraction of this pool, right? So about how many are here? They found about 250 to 300 polypeptides there. So about 10% of these cytoplasmic proteins were found to be interacting here, right? So on the basis of the experiment, we can conclude, you know, these are polypeptides that interact with GROWEL here. Okay, so now Kenny has a few additional observations in this gel. What, what are those? So how are these polypeptides distributed? And we'll just focus on C for the moment. So in terms of molecular weight, what do we see? And so we have a wide range, and where is that range? And how does that range compare to here? So I agree, but look at the subtleties. <laughs> Most of them are above eight kilons. Yeah, so let's roughly say in the range of 20, right? So if we look at the bottom part of the gel versus the top part of the gel here, and we compare that to the bottom part of the gel here and the top part of the gel here, we see some differences that aren't just the total number of, of spots. It Rebecca? also looks like the ones that are smaller, so for the, one, the spots that correspond to the smaller proteins, they seem to be more highly charged. They're more highly charged. Yeah, so let's first stick to the size, right? So we're seeing that in the bottom region of this gel, where we have lower <coughs> molecular weight species, we see fewer of these um, here than here. So why might that be if there's less polypeptides with molecular weights smaller than 20 kilodaltons. Steve? Well, yeah. if you just consider the total number of possible conformations a protein can adopt, or a peptide to adopt as an exponential function of its size, um, larger proteins are more likely to have more non-productive folding pathways. Yeah. So it's just less likely to have something that needs a chaperone at a smaller size. Right. So maybe these smaller polypeptides, they need less help. Their domain structure is more simple, for instance. Um, they're easier to fold, and other machinery can take, take care of that here. Okay. And then if we look at PI, what do we see? So how is the distribution in terms of PI? Yeah. The large molecular weight proteins are pretty evenly distributed, but the smaller ones are, have to be more charged. Or they're, they're yeah. yeah. How do you no, use I, the word I, charged? So. Sorry, I was I wasn't looking at the scale. They actually like have like a pi closer to seven. So yeah. So, really you know, always just like you heard in recitations two and three, pay attention to to the scale and what kind of charge, if you're talking about charge, right, you have negatively charged and positively charged amino acids, so, so where in that, that regime are you, right? But if we look at, you know, these areas here, we see a wide distribution, right? And maybe when they're smaller, we're seeing some more over here, but then, I mean, ask yourself, is 22 an outlier, you know, there? Okay, so What can be done in terms of these data? Um, this is actually analysis of the gels looking at 
total proteins and GROWEL bound proteins for the total percentage in terms of PI um, and in terms of molecular weight. And so you can compare, right? And so what we see is that overall, and look a bit closer, that PI, the distributions are quite similar. Molecular weight, we see some differences. Okay, we also don't see that many proteins that are greater than 90 kilodaltons being folded by this machine. Okay, and then again, why might that be? We learned that the chamber can accommodate polypeptides up to about 60 kilodaltons, right? So maybe they're just too big here. So what are the identities of these proteins here, right? So this is where the trypsin digest and mass spec comes into play. So we can imagine extracting the spots, digesting them with the protease trypsin, and then doing mass spec analysis to find out the identities and comparing that data to, to databases um, of E. coli proteins. And so from that, of the 250 to 300 proteins that they identified in these immunoprecipitation gels, they were able to identify 52 without a doubt. Um, and what are some of those 52 proteins? So I've just highlighted a few examples. Um, what, what do we see? So here's our friend EFTU um, as one example. We see subunit of RNA polymerase, ferritin, and certain ribosomal proteins. So just thinking about these proteins and their role um, in translation, in um, RNA polymerization, <coughs> ferritin is an iron storage protein. What do we think? What are, what are our thoughts about these proteins? They're pretty important, right? Imagine if EFTU couldn't adopt its native conformation, right? There might be some major problems. Um, there. And recall when I introduced GROWEL, GROWES, we learned that they fall into the category of chaperonin, so they're essential for life. Um, so that makes sense in terms of seeing some of these proteins as being very important. And what about structural motifs? If then we see, okay, these are the 50 proteins we identified, what are their structural features? And what does that tell us about this chaperone? Um, the conclusion is that overall, the proteins identified have quite complex structural um, features. So these can range to, from complex domain organization um, to beta sheets, including those that are buried and have large hydrophobic surfaces here. Um, and so we can speculate that maybe some of these hydrophobic surfaces um, interact with the GROWEL apical domain to have these polypeptides enter into the chamber. Here, was there a question? Um, well, I was going to ask, I'm not sure, I don't know for ferritin, but I know that we, you need a lot of ferritin molecules to form the thing. Mm -hmm. um, but all of those are also, and again, that's only 4 out of 52, but they're all proteins that exist in relatively high abundances, so could you also be making an argument that proteins that are more likely to have high concentrations and therefore a high, higher probability of aggregating just because it's a bimolecular reaction um, could um, be fa or could uh, favor binding to grow it up. Yeah, I even thought about it in terms of, they certainly are abundant. Um, it, it could be, it, it could be, I just don't know. Yeah, the experimental back. setup have also biased it towards more abundant proteins. Yeah, so could that have happened in the experimental setup? It's a possibility, right? So we learned that what EFTU is about 10% of all ribosomal proteins. Yeah, so that's something also to keep in mind and a good thought there. So what else can we learn? One more observation from these experiments before we move on to DNA KJ. Right, so recall last time when we talked about the actual pulse chase experiment, they took samples at multiple time points, right? And so why did they do that? You can imagine doing this analysis not just at zero minutes and 10 minutes, but at a variety of time points and ask if we compare gel to gel, 
and we compare spot to spot, right? So going back, these spots are labeled, um, many of them in here. We can ask the question, how does the intensity of that spot change over time? And what does that tell us about the interactions of that polypeptide um, with GROW-EL, right? So just for example, um, here, right? Example, just imagine at time equals zero, we see some protein or polypeptide X, okay? So then what happens at, say, time equals two minutes? Okay. If we do not see it, let's consider two options, okay? Do not see X, okay? Maybe we conclude that X dissociates quickly okay, or folds, you know, relatively easily, right? Imagine if we do see X after two minutes here, maybe the conclusion is X is not yet folded. Here, okay. And then we can imagine doing this at different time points, and they went out to 10 minutes here, okay? So maybe if we see X at 10 minutes, the conclusion is X is difficult to fold. And two, we want to think about these time points also from the standpoint of what we saw in terms of the residency time of a polypeptide in the GROW-EL chamber, right? So we saw from the various models that that's somewhere on the order of six to 10 seconds, right? So there can be multiple um, binding and release events that occur. So in this paper, what the authors did is trace the spots um, and compare the intensities of the spots over time, right? And you can do a little exercise from these gels looking at spots they circled and just ask qualitatively um, what's happening to the spot? Is the intensity staying the same? Is it being reduced? So for instance, it's easy to look at spot number 22 here at zero minutes versus spot 22 at 10 minutes, right? And what do we see? Does it look the same, more intense, less intense? Less intense, right? What about spot number 12 at zero minutes versus 10 minutes? Yeah, they look quite similar, like by eye, right? So you can imagine doing this type of exercise through each gel and actually doing it quantitatively using some instrumentation. <coughs> so what do they see? Um, effectively, in this, they divided the data into three groups based on certain trends, okay? And that, that's shown here, where what we're looking at is the relative intensity change versus time. So you can imagine at some time point that spot has a maximum intensity that they've put at 100. Okay, so we see the three groups here, and the question is if we look at these as groups, what do the data show? Okay, so in group one, we see examples where the spot at time equals zero is at a maximum, and then the intensity of that, those spots decrease over time. And the other thing we see is that at some time, um, that isn't very long, the intensities go to approximately zero. So we're not seeing these polypeptides bound any longer. And then effectively, what we want to ask is, do these polypeptides have any similar features? And what the authors observed is that 
the polypeptides falling into this group, showing this behavior, um, are smaller than 60 kilodaltons. And as shown here, they're seeing them completely released over the time course of this experiment, and in, generally, in general within the first two minutes. Okay, so what does that correspond to? How they interpreted this was that these polypeptides um, are either binding GROEL once or have several rounds of binding um, and ultimately reach their folded state in this relatively short time period. So how does group two differ looking at these data? What do we see in group two that's different from group one? Yeah. yeah, right, we're seeing the relative intensity never go all the way to zero. So here we've gone to zero. Here we see, you know, 20 to 30 percent um, as the cutoff. So how are these data interpreted in this work, and, and what are the identities of these polypeptides? So similar to group one, these polypeptides are also all smaller than 60 kilodaltons. Um, and how this behavior is interpreted is that even after 10 minutes, there's some fraction of these polypeptides um, that are still associated with GROEL, right? So they haven't reached their native fold um, and are remaining bound. What's going on in this group here, group three? Okay, this behavior is very different. Yep. And they also don't go to zero after 10 minutes. Yes, right. So these proteins are interacting with GROEL because they were pulled down, but it looks like they're interacting at later time points, right? So we see this growth in terms of increase in intensity over time, and then they go down, okay? And here we see 40% or higher. Um, so they are not readily dissociating, binding at longer time points. Um, so one question here is, are these dead-end species? Um, you know, and within this work, the authors did some additional controls, which there's some detail in the notes I'll post in lecture, um, but effectively asking what happens if we add in GROES, what happens if we add in ATP, do we still see these species or not? Um, and some of them were released under those conditions there. So in summary, um, what we see from this is a method to look at, you know, chaperone substrate, um, selection in the context of a cell, right? We see that GROEL folds proteins over a range of sizes, but not really the small ones. So under 20 kilodaltons, um, not so much, and over 60 kilodaltons, not so much here, and that these polypeptide substrates have complex native folds. So um, where we're going to close the chaperone unit is with looking at the machinery DNA K J. And so we'll introduce that system and then look at a similar series of experiments where the substrate scope um, for this chaperone system was evaluated. So if we go back to the overview from the start um, where all of these players were introduced, this is where we are now. So we're looking at DNA K and it's co-chaperone DNA J. So these are downstream of trigger factor. What do we have for DNA K and J? Here. Um, so these are heat shock proteins. DNA K is an HSP70, so 70 kilodaltons, and HSP70s are ubiquitous. Um, so just to note, they're involved in a variety of protein quality control functions. So we have folding, as we'll talk about in the context of today's lecture in this um, module, um, but even roles that range from you know, protein transport to assisting with protein degradation occur. So here we have HSP70 for DNA K and HSP40 for DNA J. Okay. 
So in this system, DNA K is the chaperone, and DNA J is the co-chaperone, and DNA K is ATP dependent. So it's monomeric. So with this system, we don't have a chamber like we have with grow E L, grow E S. Um, and it's ATP dependent. Okay, DNA J is the co chaperone. Here. So, what happens in terms of this system? So, effectively, DNA J, the co chaperone, um, scans hydrophobic surfaces of proteins or polypeptides. Okay, and it associates with them, so it binds. Okay, and then what DNA J does is it delivers non native polypeptides to DNA K. Okay, and then how we think about DNA K, okay, is that DNA K binds and releases unfolded polypeptides. Okay, and this is another case where there can be multiple cycles of binding and release. So DNA K will bind to a polypeptide that has an unfolded region. There'll be some period of time that that complex exists and then DNA K will release it. Okay, and so in terms of where it likes to bind, these are typically six to nine amino acid segments that are hydrophobic. Okay, so it likes residues like leucine and isoleucine. And statistically, this type of region occurs about every 40 amino acids. And for these segments, just to note that there's a range of binding affinities, right? You can imagine there's very, like, a variety um, of possibilities here. And what's found from studies is that the KD of DNA K for various polypeptides can range. from about five nanomolar to about five micromolar, so by several orders of magnitude. Um, in terms of size of polypeptide, it's stated that DNA K has some preference for polypeptides on the order of 20 to 30 kilodaltons, um, but it can bind larger ones and it can bind polypeptides greater than 60 kilodaltons, um, as we'll see later. So in this system, there's another player that we need to think about, and that's this GRPE, or GRIP-E. Okay. And what we have here is a nucleotide exchange factor. So NEF. And um, it's also a thermosensor. Okay, and what GRIP E does is that it regulates DNA K binding to a substrate by inducing ADP release. 
So what we'll see is that the ATP and ADP bound forms of DNA K have different affinities for these polypeptide substrates. Okay, so what we're going to do um, is look at the structures of the components of this system and then look at the cycle. And so if we consider DNA K, Um, so we think of this protein as having two different domains. So there's an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain. Okay, and in this N-terminal domain, what we have is the nucleotide binding domain, NBD. Um, so this is where ATPase activity occurs. Okay, and this is about 44 kilodaltons here. Okay, there's a linker region. And then in this C-terminal end, we have the peptide binding or substrate binding domain. Okay, this is 27 kilodaltons. Okay, so here, um, if we think about this part just in cartoon form, what's observed is that there's a cleft for binding ATP or ADP. Okay, so ATP or ADP binds here, okay? And this is also where um, the nucleotide exchange factor, Grippy, will interact, right? Because that's its job as a nucleotide exchange factor is to um, help with that. So basically we have, you know, Grippy here. Um, what we see in this domain um, it's often described as being a beta sandwich, okay, plus an alpha helical latch, okay, and the idea is that this latch closes um, in the presence of the polypeptide. Okay, so effectively, if we look at this as a cartoon, and we'll look at actual structures in a minute, this peptide binding domain can either be in an open form, okay, and this is the latch. We have the alpha helical part, here's the beta sandwich, and if there's some polypeptide to bind, what happens is that the latch closes, and you know the polypeptide is bound here, so this is the closed form. Okay, and this pocket is hydrophobic. And that makes sense based on what we know about DNA K liking to bind hydrophobic stretches. So let's look at some structures of DNA K. Um, I present two slides of structures here, one from the assigned review um, and this other version, and I'll just focus on this one for here. Um, so here we're looking at the domain organization. Um, what we have here is the nucleotide binding domain. So here's that cleft for ATP binding. Here we're looking at the peptide binding domain. So the beta sandwich region is in green, the alpha helical latch is in yellow, and we see that there's a model polypeptide here, and this is in the closed form. Okay, here's another view of DNA K with a peptide bound. So we see 
the beta sandwich, here's the alpha helical latch. Um, this depiction here from the review is showing the closed and open states, and closed and open is referring to the green area here, okay? So don't get confused with the nucleobind nucleotide binding domain and how these are shown. Um, so what we see here, again, there's a bound polypeptide in this peptide binding domain. And here, there's no bound polypeptide. And we see that now this alpha helical region is sticking up there. So what about DNA J? Um, we consider DNA J Um, we're just going to focus on the domain organization. And just a more simplified view than what's on the slide. We have two domains, OK, for DNA K binding. OK, and then for you know, peptide binding. So DNA K is going to go out there and find some polypeptide that needs the help of DNA J. It's going to bind that polypeptide and deliver it to DNA K. So effectively, it interacts both with the polypeptide substrate, and it also acts with DNA K when delivering this polypeptide. Um, so just to point out, um, DNA J is part of an HSP40 family, and these are quite diverse. Um, I just illustrate that from you know, the range of different sizes, so from about 100 to about 2,000 <coughs> amino acids. And all of these HSP40s have what's called a J domain. Um, and in this more detailed depiction here, it's indicated these 70 amino acids at the end terminus um, are the J domain, and they're important for interacting with DNA K or another HSP70. So what about GRIP E? This nucleotide exchange factor. Um, so GRIP E is a homodimer. Okay. And if we just look at one monomer and then I'll show you the structure. So in 97, a crystal structure of GRIP E with a DNA K um, nucleotide binding domain was published, and this is what came from that. So just use your imagination. Maybe I'll draw this a little differently. OK, basically what we see with GRIP E is that there's a beta sheet. OK, and this is the C-terminal region. And then what we see here is an extended alpha helix. Okay, and this is the N-terminal region. Okay, and and this is just a cartoon of the monomer. Okay, so what happens is that the GRIP E homodimer um, uses one of the beta sheets of one monomer to insert into that. Um, ATP binding cleft here of DNA K. Okay, and when that happens, it forces it open um, there. So let's look at the structure, and this is something that actually puzzled me for quite some time, um, but there's been a recent update. So this is a crystal structure of GRIP E homodimer. So we see one monomer in blue and one monomer in green bound to an N terminal. Um, nucleotide binding domain of DNA K, which is shown in pink. Okay, and so we see 
the beta sheet region of each monomer, we see the extended alpha helix. The C terminal end is here, the N terminal end is here. Um, and I note that not shown in this structure is there's an unfolded region after the end here of grip E. And so we see this nucleotide binding domain interacting with one of the beta sheets, so a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Okay, and so the idea, and as we'll see when we go forth with the cycle, is that grip E is inserting the C-terminal beta sheet into the nucleotide binding clef of DNA K. Okay, and this happens for the ADP bound form and it facilitates ADP release. Okay, so what's going on down here? Why is there this extended alpha helix? Um, and I'll just note there was a study just in the past year um, where interactions between DNA K and GRIP E were studied um, in some more detail. So they used some biochemical experiments, some cryo electron microscopy. Um, and what they learned is that the interactions between GRIP E and DNA K are more complex than what's seen here. And um, what they observe in their cryo EM is evidence for this N terminal region interacting with the substrate or polypeptide binding domain of DNA K. Okay, so there's some dynamics and flexibility that we can't appreciate from this crystal structure. And so that begs into question, how else is GRIP E facilitating this cycle um, and modulating conformation and function of DNA K? Um, so you're not responsible for these details, but if it's something you're curious about, I've included the reference. So effectively, GRIP E accelerates the release of ADP, um, and that in turn promotes binding of ATP. So what is the functional cycle? Um, and we'll look at this depiction here. There's another depiction in the notes from the reading. Um, this is the current model. And in this model, we're going to start here. So what do we see? We have DNA K in the ATP bound <coughs> form. So we have the two domains, right? The nucleotide binding domain and here the polypeptide substrate binding domain. And in this cartoon, we see that alpha helical latch is open, so no polypeptides bound. Okay, and what we also see is that the ATPase activity here is very, very low. Okay, so DNA K is not hydrolyzing its ATP. So then what happens? DNA K, the, or sorry, DNA J, the Koch chaperone, has found some polypeptide substrate indicated by this S that needs the help of DNA K. So there's J binds the polypeptide substrate and it delivers that polypeptide to DNA K. Okay, so what does this cartoon tell us? It tells us that J is interacting with K and here we see the polypeptide substrate being delivered. Okay, so when DNA K is in the ATP bound form, it binds peptides with relatively low affinity and in a reversible manner. So there's fast exchange, that polypeptide's going to come on and off. And when DNA J binds and delivers the polypeptide, it activates the ATPase activity of DNA K. Okay, so that's indicated here. So the ATPase activity is enhanced um, substantially. So you can compare the values for some quantitative insight. There's ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis results in release of DNA J and PI. So now what do we have? ATP is hydrolyzed and now we have ADP bound in the nucleotide binding domain. And what do we see? The latch has closed, okay, open, closed. So like what we saw in the structures with those model polypeptides bound, we have the substrate um, clamped in this latch. So here we have a form of DNA K that binds the polypeptide with high affinity and slow exchange. So this state is considered to be long lived um, on the order of 10 to 15 seconds. So the question is, if this is binding the polypeptide with high affinity and slow exchange, how do we release it, right? And that's where this nucleotide exchange factor, GRIP-E, comes into play. <coughs> 
So here comes along grip E. Grip E binds. Grip E binding results in release of ADP from the nucleotide binding domain. Okay, so grip E is inserting its beta sheet into that cleft, and it looks like something else is happening with that long alpha helix to facilitate this. Um, but this was drawn before that 2015 study, so we just see it interacting here. But imagine that this region here is maybe um, interacting down here and doing something um, to facilitate peptide release. So now what? No nucleotides bound according to this model. Since the ADP is released, ATP binding is facilitated, so ATP can bind. And what do we see? There's release of the peptide, release of grip E, and this cycle can start over again. Okay? So effectively, um, release of ADP is accelerated about 5,000 fold from um, the action of grip E. Right? And so grip E is called a thermosensor and can begin to think about why that might be if, say, there's condition of heat shock or stress. Maybe the cell wants DNA K to be able to hold on to this polypeptide rather than release it. So grip E won't be doing its job um, under those conditions. So another example of ATP binding and hydrolysis, you know, modulating um, activity of these chaperones. So we need to think about what are the substrates for DNA KJ and what is the chaperone system doing, right? So we defined possibilities as foldases, right? Like what we saw with GROEL, um, holdases, unfoldases, what's, what's happening here? And so um, in thinking about the in vitro substrates, what are the experiments we're going to do? Or sorry, in vivo substrates. So can we take the method used for GROEL, GROES and adapt it to this system? Are you convinced that method was useful, or are you down on that method? It could probably be adapted. Yeah, right, it can be adapted, right? So can imagine, again, going to do pulse chase here, and can imagine the same experiment where we have our E. coli with no methionine to deplete, right? We can pulse with radio-labeled methionine. Again, 15 seconds, 30 degrees Celsius, to let us see newly synthesized polypeptides. And this gives us a way to ask what newly synthesized polypeptides do DNA, K, and J act on, right? Then we can chase with excess unlabeled methionine for 10 minutes, okay, and again can take samples at varying times, okay, do rapid lysis, okay, and in this case, rather than using EDTA to quench, what they did um, is do rapid ATP removal by adding um, an ATPase here. So just to realize that there's theme and variations in terms of how you can quench these. Okay. So what do they find? And we'll go over the data in more detail starting on Monday. Um, and what do they need to do to find that, right? So in this case, they need an antibody 
to DNAK if there's going to be an immunoprecipitation, right? Okay, so in these experiments, effectively, we're to this point. They immunoprecipitated with their DNAK antibody. Of course, the specificity of this antibody needed to be um, studied. And then they used SDS page um, to analyze the immunoprecipitates. And so what we'll see when we discuss the data next time, um, the experiments were analogous to what was done with GROW-EL, GROW-ES, but a few differences. Um, they were less sophisticated in terms of the approach. So they used just standard 1D SDS page rather than 2D. Um, and they didn't go through the process of doing um, trypsin digest and mass spec to identify the polypeptide. So it's more of a qualitative look. Um, but we're going to ask, starting on Monday, what did they learn um, from analyzing these gels about the substrate scope of DNA KJ? And then we have to ask the question, how does that help our understanding in terms of the type of chaperone activity that's occurring? Okay. So with that, I'll close. Um, we'll end the chaperone unit with those experiments on Monday, and then we'll transition into module three on the proteasome and um, degradation chambers.